Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our Lethality Series. This is episode 15, I want to say, and this is probably the most important video out of this entire series, and I'm going to say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, this is the foundation upon which every single one of these battle drills and tactics and, and stuff that we've talked about previously, this is the foundation of it all. If you don't have this, you will not be able to execute on any of the other battle drills and tactics and techniques that we've talked about up until that this point that was a mouthful of words so we're going to be talking about individual ranger discipline today uh, i call it individual ranger discipline just because that's what we called it but i mean this is individual soldier discipline this is individual you know minute man discipline if you want to talk about like that um but this is like your basics your basic soldiering disciplines. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, just general stuff. We're going to talk about pre-mission discipline. We're going to talk about during mission discipline and post-mission disciplines. Uh, I mean, some of this stuff is not going to be super applicable to, to like your average dude, but a lot of this, if you're working in a small unit, a small team, this is the shit that you need to have down pat. Um, this applies to everyone. This doesn't just apply to your your privates, your your tabs, like your lower ranking enlisted guys. This applies to every single person, uh, every single ranger out on a, an objective. So, so like I said, most important video, and this is really what sets us apart is our ability to maintain discipline. There's uh, there's times in the jock on my fifth deployment where we'd be watching and we'd be able to tell. There was like some joint uh, joint raids going on um, between Ranger and uh, SMU, and for <laughs> the, we were able to tell who the Rangers were on the ground because we had by the book textbook, uh, you know, formations, and we were moving in formation textbook. Like you could tell which guy was a Ranger and which guy was an SMU guy. Um, they're a little bit more cowboy, um, I will say. Some more so than others. It really depends on on the to the team you're working with. They they vary vastly between uh, between teams, or squadrons, or whatever you want to say. Um, but I digress. This is, like I said, the most important thing that you could learn and implement in your own life and in your career as a fighting age male. So we'll talk knowledge and abilities first. So a good ranger is going to be an SME or a subject matter expert on his assigned weapon system. So he should know all about his rifle. He should know all about his pistol, his grenade launcher, his machine gun, etc., etc. He needs to know the rates of fire. He needs to know what a sustained rate of fire is, what a rapid rate of fire is. He needs to know how to take that thing apart, blindfolded, put it back together, blindfolded. He needs to know what critical areas need to be spotless for it to work. He needs to know exactly what parts are prone to breaking and how to mitigate and prevent that and plan for it. He needs to know what his zero is at different ranges. He needs to know his holdovers needs for his particular type, type of optic. I could go on and on and on about this, but this is really the foundation is a good ranger is going to know everything about his weapon and everything about every single light infantry weapon that his platoon has access to. Moving on. So he needs to know battle drills. He needs to know the names and he needs to know where he fits into a specific battle drill based on his assigned weapon or his assigned position in the squad or the team. Pretty straightforward. Um, we're not going to go and get too nitty gritty with specifics here. He needs to be a ranger first responder. Now this is a program that, you learn in RASP and other other units call, call it a combat life support, um, basic combat life support. Um, Ranger first responder, I think, gets a little bit more in depth. We get trained on how to conduct needle decompression and junctional tourniquets, stuff like that. Stuff that's a little bit outside of the normal scope of practice for like normal combat life support, to my knowledge. Um, and then you have also advanced ranger first responder. But at minimum, every single ranger is a ranger first responder. Um, they're trained on it. And this is what has given the 75th Ranger Regiment the greatest survivability in the global war on terror. Not a single 
ranger that was injured that could survive his injuries was ever ever died um based due to due to his injuries if if we could save him he was saved basically um there's some pretty amazing stories out there uh, we're not going to talk about them in this episode but this is what makes us so unique and survivable as well as our medics our medics are the best in the world and i will throw hands with anyone who says otherwise because one of my best friends is a medic and he's done some pretty amazing shit um want to get him on the podcast one day but however he is still in active duty service and will be for some time so it might be a few years (laughs) lastly they're going to know need to know how to operate any assigned vehicles um Again, based on their kind of their position in the squad, if you're a, a private or a tab without a saw gun, saw rather, <laughs> saw gun, you're going to need to know how to drive whatever vehicle you guys have access to. Sometimes they're strikers, sometimes they're Humvees, sometimes they're M razors, you know, whatever vehicle package you have as part of your team, as part of your unit, whatever the fuck you want to call it, you need to know how to operate it in low light and freaking daylight. You need to know everything about it. You need to, to be able to maneuver that thing over roads and rough terrain. All right. Now we're going to talk abilities here. So this is, this is going to be broad and this isn't going to turn into a fitness video, but you need to maintain part of, yeah, part of Ranger discipline is maintaining a proper fighting and being in proper fighting shape. So that's kind of my own definition and my own definition as, as, as follows. So it's a combination of strength, the ability to conduct explosive movements, such as sprinting and jumping over walls and overall cardiovascular endurance, meaning the ability to move long distances over uneven terrain while under load day or night. So very, very long definition. Um, but it's for a reason. So you don't want dudes who are just straight beefcakes. <laughs> a lot of Rangers are, however, The majority of them also can still back it up with cardiovascular endurance as well as explosive movements. Um, You don't see a whole lot of just gigantic guys in a regiment. The majority are pretty, you know, are built, they're muscular. Uh, They're not skinny by any means. And if they are skinny, they they get fixed, (laughs) Um, you know, with protein and creatine and stuff. But you don't get like crazy gigantic dudes they're the outlier for sure most of you like i said most of your guys are pretty not lanky but they have lean muscle but they're freakishly strong and they're able to just keep moving and move and move and move with load and then they're able to sprint when the when the opportunity and when you need to and then lastly they're an expert at their role and they understand the role immediately above theirs and is prepared at any single moment to fill that role. So as a, you know, as a private with just a rifle, you need to know how to run a 320. You need to know how to be a grenadier. You need to know kind of what his role is in a battle drill, in the tactical plan, etc. As a saw gunner, you need to know your team leaders, uh, role what he does you need to be able to step into the role of a team leader at any single moment because whether it's in combat or whether it's due to outside circumstances such as your team leader was a fucking idiot in the gym and blew his back out on a deadlift or your team leader his wife you know is having a baby and he gets sent home mid-row deployment or you know worst case scenario he takes one to the fucking dome on the x and you have to step up and fill that role so you need to be able to understand and be able to get practice in in a situation in, in training situations prior to you know having to do it for real on the ground in real time so that's all we'll say about that and we're going to keep it moving all right so we're going to talk pre-mission i really like this picture this is a cool picture i haven't seen before but you see uh, we got a law here and we would throw la5s on the law um, to aim these at night. So cool little, uh, cool little TTP there, I guess. Uh, Cause they do have a rail. Um, these laws have a rail here, so you could put a fucking optic on it too, if you wanted to, but we would usually just throw an extra, an extra laser on there and zero it to like one or 200 meters. Um, and then after, obviously after you shoot it, you would, you would detach the laser and, and take it with you. Um, because they are expendable rockets. You could, you could leave them on the ground. You wouldn't necessarily try and pack them with you. 
Anyways, all right, so pre-mission. And this is going to be in the context of the GWAT. Um, obviously, this can be adapted for any kind of tactical situation, um, whether it's you know being in a patrol base or you know anything outside of you know being in a secure FOB kind of area. But that's kind of where what this is. This is kind of a breakdown of of what you're if you're running missions overseas. This is kind of what it looked like, and this is kind of how the the battle rhythm would go, and how you best fit into it so pre-mission we'll start here with equipment maintenance so you need to have your shit and your assigned equipment and firearms and gear it needs to be ready to go at all times if something breaks you need to figure out how to fix it you need to go to the armor and get it fixed uh, you need to make sure your shit is zeroed you do that immediately after you get overseas within the first 24 48 hours and you have your shit staged, ready to go at a minute's notice because you never know when you're going to get a time-sensitive target. You might get called for QRF, potentially, um, no-notice QRF. Um, it just needs to be ready to go. It needs to be maintained. It needs to be clean and in fighting shape. So talking about yourself, you need to be try and keep yourself properly fed and hydrated, at minimum properly hydrated. You want to stack the odds in your favor. If you have to get, if you get a called out and your platoon gets called out on a raid and it's a freaking 15k offset and you've been slamming rippets and fucking energy drinks up until that point and haven't been drinking water, you're probably going to fall out. You might be a liability on the way there. So if you're on a war footing and if you're over there to do fucking battle, you need to keep yourself ready to go at all times when you have the opportunity to do so. Again, a lot of other units don't get the the, the luxuries that we got. Um, they're out on freaking cops in the mountains, fucking sucking, not you know eating MREs and uh, not getting as much water as they probably need to, and, and having to pull security, and not getting as much rest. But if you have the opportunity to, you need to be stacking the odds in your favor as far as how your body feels. All right, now we're talking about the actual plan here. So. When you get a mission, you're going to sit through a briefing and your squad leader is going to brief his role and your squad's role at each, every single point of the mission. So you need to be in there and either get this, if you're not actually in the briefing, which all Rangers are, like we bring every single person into our briefs. Um, it just eliminates the need to worry about having to pass on information. So. He needs to know and explain at minimum his squad's role in the ground tactical plan, as well as his own responsibilities and, and the special teams that he is part of. So whether that's the detainee team, excuse me, whether he's carrying the litter uh, or if he's acting as an ARFR on this mission, uh, whether he's carrying demo, he needs to know at what point in the in the operation that he his role is going to be needed. He might be carrying a ladder. He might be a ladder team. Um and yeah, like I said, a minimum, just his squad's role. He, ideally, he knows the entire plan. He knows exactly where each squad's going. He knows at what point they break off. He knows how long the infill is. He knows what chalk he's on. Um, that's the next thing here is he knows his inside infill and exfill chalk or vehicle. Um, and if you're not taking vehicles, he knows his, uh, his position and his squad's position in the order of movement. And he knows at least the distance that he's going, the, at the, the direction and ideally he would have some kind of grid as well. So moving on. So when we're talking about pre-combat checks now, so there's PCCs and then there's PCIs. So people think they're the same and they're not. I'll briefly describe the difference. So pre-combat check is done at your individual level. And then a pre-combat inspection is done at your leader's level. So you personally check yourself and then your first line, or maybe, you know, your second line is going to come and inspect you and he's going to be looking for a bunch of different things. And good leaders always do pre-combat inspections. Um, they're going to make sure their guys are checked and that they have everything they need to not die and to be successful on the mission. So you, the, the first thing we'll talk about that a lot, a lot of people probably don't talk about is wearing an appropriate uniform for the climate expected on the way to as well as on the X. So... What does this mean? It means you need to know your own body. You need to know if you run hot. Like I personally run hot. So if I knew that I was going to be taking a fucking long walk, I probably wouldn't layer up even if it was planning to be cold. You know, I'd probably pack in my in my back flap or in a, in a three-day salt pack 
like a, a three alpha, some kind of, of top to put on if we do an extended halt for an extended period of time. Um, but I know that I get really warm whenever I am conducting any kind of long movement. I, I just run hot. That's how I am. Um, but if you know that you're prone to getting cold more so than hot, you know, you might need to wear another layer or two or pack another layer or two. So it's, this is kind of what you have to know and, and experience for yourself. And you'll kind of develop your own system of layers that works for you. Um, the next thing you want is good fucking properly broken in boots with quality socks. Um, your feet are critical. <laughs> like I, I can't stress this one enough either. Uh, if you don't have good boots and if they're not broken in, you're going to be hating life. You're, you're going to hate life and you're going to become potentially a liability to your platoon. Um, I personally like to tape my laces up as well. So if I know that we're doing a movement through fucking shitty terrain or like through the woods where there's going to be a lot of like ground shit, like branches and, and, and vines on the ground, I'm going to tape my laces up because I've had them come undone a lot and it's just a pain in the ass. No matter how many times I knot them and tuck them in, they always find a way to work their way out and I have to freaking tie them in the middle of a movement and it's just unprofessional. So I like to tape my laces. Um, you're going to ensure, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to ensure that your optics and your lasers are zero primary optics. If you have a secondary optic on there, um, and then you need to make sure your laser is zeroed. And then building off of that, you're going to want to make sure that the batteries and all of your optics, lasers, lights, nods, radios, uh, phones, tactical phones, cameras, anything that takes a battery needs to have a fresh battery in it before stepping off. And then you need to function check that piece of equipment. Shouldn't have to spend too much time and explain why that's important. And then the next thing is you're going to check your tie downs on sensitive items. Now, this is kind of, you know, unique to the army is gear accountability. You have all of your optics and lasers and lights and your nods. They're all going to be tied down to, you know, like the weapon system or your helmet or your kit. And this is something you do in ranger school a whole lot. Like you tie down your fucking rifle to your body, like to your flick. Um, but we do this in regiment too. And outside of the army, like I would say, like you could make the argument that there is a reason to tie things down, but then you could argue just as well. It's like, Hey, like it's my own personal shit. Like if I lose it, I lose it. Or like I would, you know, you know, be able to recognize when it comes off my gun. Um, so like outside of the army, I personally don't really see a reason to tie things down. Uh, However, I'm sure that there are people out there that do, but the military are going to tie your shit down. So you're going to check and make sure all of those are good to go. They're not frayed and they're all secure and done properly. All right. And then you're going to show your magazines are topped off and then you have your belts are prop. If you're a saw gun or a machine gunner, your belts are properly loaded inside of your Amazine or uh, Jesus Christ, Amazine inside of your magazine, drums, drums, etc., And you have the uh the links facing the right direction so when you pull them out of your drum they're actually going to be loaded into the gun properly and then if you're a 40 mic mic gun or a grenadier you're going to make sure that you have all of your rounds that you need to take you need to know and distinguish between different types of rounds so different types of pouches or on the left side of the body i have just he and then on the right side of the body i have hedp so and however many you're you're designated to carry when i was a grenadier uh our loadout i want to say was like I think it was like 20 rounds, uh, 20 or 24. I had a, my loadout was, I had four or five on my chest. And then I had a canteen pouch that held another, I think six. And then I had a belt. I had the tactical tailor 40 mic mic bandolier that I would wear around my waist. And that held another 12. Um, that was a small aside there. Oops, going back. All right, so you make sure your bleeder kit's squared away. Make sure you have a minimum of, of two tourniquets uh, per ranger. And then if you have a casualty card and if your unit uses casualty cards and bump cards, make sure those are filled out and stowed in the appropriate place. If you're carrying frags, make sure they're secured in an actual frag pouch with the jungle clip removed and the pin side of the frag is towards the body in the back, like the back side of the pouch. You need to make sure your water source is or source is topped off. 
and you need to have simple carbs if available. Um, we would get like goose, like the Gatorade, like chewy goose or the honey stingers, just something that with, with simple sugars and stuff to, to keep you from cramping on longer movements. Um, and I would use these on rucks and stuff. Like if we were doing a long walk, like I would have, you know, a bunch of these in my cargo pocket and like every single mile or two, I would eat a whole pack or like eat like half a pack just to, just to keep the, uh, keep energy in the system. And as far as water, it really depends on the mission. Like you want to bring water. Um, I think our SOP was about a hundred ounces of water, um, before stepping off. So like a full camel back and then maybe a couple water bottles either on your back panel or in your pockets somewhere that it's maybe accessible, maybe not. Maybe you have to get a buddy to, to give you a water bottle, but you do need to bring water. It's critical. And then your kit needs to be set up properly. You need to make sure that all your pouches are secured. You need to make sure there's nothing that's going to be rattling around in any of your pouches. And you need to not have any extra extraneous shit on your kit because, you know, it's going to add up in weight and it's going to make your life miserable if you're just carrying a bunch of extra bullshit. Uh, I, I always wanted to carry like a fucking tomahawk on target um, or on my kit. And I never did just because it would get in the way of if I had to carry a pack as well as it was just weight that didn't need to be brought. You know, uh, we had other breaching tools that would, you know, essentially replace the need to have a tomahawk, such as a halligan or a hooligan tool um, or a sledge, etc. So this is kind of stuff you have to figure out on your own as well. All right. Now, if you're bringing any kind of special equipment, you need to make sure that shit works, make sure it functions how it's intended, and you need to make sure it's silenced. And then if it's a larger item, such as a ladder, a litter, a quickie saw, any kind of specialized breaching equipment, such as a hooligan or a sledge, anything like that, it needs to be marked with a unbroken IR chem light, like one of the small ones. And the intent here is you use it. And then when you have to set it down and leave it, um, because you're preparing to enter a building or whatever, you break that IR chem quickly so that you can see it on the ground and you know that to pick it up later. If you're carrying explosives, um, you need to be storing those correctly. And some of the, the SOP for us was uh, the main charge needs to have plate contact. Granted, it's not going to do much for you if it decides to go off, which they don't really do that because the explosives we use for breaching were very all very, very safe. There's, I mean, they're explosives though, so they're still dangerous at the end of the day. Uh, and then you need to make sure that your initiators and your blasting caps are stored on opposite sides of your body um, to make sure that those blasting caps, which are a lot more sensitive, aren't near the main charge at all to where, you know, maybe you get, you get shot in the freaking initiators. And if you had your main charge either tied in to you, or if it was close enough to those blasting caps, then you're really fucked. Like the bullet might have hit your plate, blew up the, uh, blew up the freaking initiator or the the blasting caps, and maybe you got a little bit of frag from that. But if it was tied into your fucking main charge, you're you're done. You're fucking gone, right? So, just something to keep in mind. Uh, hands, eyes, ears. So you need to have obviously appropriate eye pro for the situations. You're not going to wear fucking dark lenses at night. You're going to wear clear lenses. You're going to have appropriate hand pro. So, you know, gloves. I am personally a fan of the, what is it? The SKD tactical, uh, the pigskin deltas. So they're super thin. They kind of wear out fast, which kind of blows, but they, they stick on my hands really well. And I can manipulate touchscreen devices with them and operate and get really good tactile feedback for my weapons. Like they're super thin and I love that about them because I can, you know, feel everything like I'm, like I'm touching with my bare hands and they do provide that element of protection. Um, and then ears, obviously you'd wear your Peltors or your, the, what are the new ones called? Shit. The Opscore amps. So you're going to have some kind of over the ear hearing protection with noise canceling. So you can turn it on and, you know, hear more ambient noise around you that amplifies like the small sounds, but it'll cut out like gunfire and shit or it'll, it'll tone it down as well as the ability to plug radios into that. And then if you're planning on riding in a helicopter and or fast roping out of the helicopter, you need to have your safety tether and fast rope gloves, which 
won't apply to most people if you're uh, just a regular dude. So moving on. And this is like right before you get on the fucking bird, not in order. Um, so you're going to load your secondary weapon first. And the reason you do that is because a lot of people will forget to load your secondary, their secondary weapon. Uh, they get, they get fucking amped up and they, they slam the mag into their rifle and they're like, all right, let's fucking go. But there's no mag in their pistol and God forbid they need that pistol. Right? So you always load your secondary first. If you're a grenadier, you're going to load your grenade launcher first to make sure that shit's on fucking safe. Um, and then if you're going to be getting onto an aircraft, if you're getting into vehicles, um, we would usually just load these normal. But if we're getting on an aircraft, we do what's called aircraft loading, which means you have the magazine for a rifle inserted into the gun with the bolt forward on safe. And as soon as you get off the bird, you charge the weapon, put it into operation. And then as a machine gunner, honestly, even on patrol, um, especially in ranger school, like I kept that shit aircraft loaded because the Sears and the ranger school guns are super fucked. Um, but even in real life, like it's, if you know you're expecting contact, it might be probably smarter to have it have it racked and ready to go. Um, but usually, I would walk as a machine gunner personally. I would walk around with my shit on aircraft loaded, unless it was like I wouldn't. I knew that I wouldn't have time to fucking rack it. If that makes sense, like when I was doing PSDs in Syria, and I was sitting in the freaking the front seat driving around the city, I'd have my saw on my lap, and I would have that shit fucking ready to go. Uh, because there weren't many of us, you know, it really, it really depends on your, on your comfortability with the weapon system and the situation. But a minimum when you're on the aircraft, that shit's going to be aircraft loaded. Last minute piss, super important to do. <laughs> no one likes to fucking get in a car or start walking or get in a helicopter and have to fucking fly or drive X many hours and then be sitting on a fucking full bladder the whole time. God forbid you're sitting on the floor of a Chinook and you got your fucking dude in front of you with a damn litter just laying back into your bladder and you got to piss. Uh, that shit's the fucking the worst. So make sure your shit's empty before you go. Uh, you're going to do any, obviously any rehearsals. That's something that kind of doesn't really have a good flow here. But like if you're going to be a ladder team for the fucking raid or you're going to be the litter, like you're going to probably run through and make sure your litter is set up right. You're going to make sure you're you're up to up to spec on your speed of deployment on your litter. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll do some kind of rehearsals before you, before you step out, whether that's just on a, on a fucking piece of piece of dirt and you're fucking drawn in the dirt or whether that's like full scale mock rehearsals with mock-up buildings. Like you saw in fucking zero dark 30, where they built the entire bin Laden compound. And then lastly, you're going to leave personal electronics kind of, it kind of makes sense, kind of, you know, common sense. Uh, but you see guys in Ukraine right now that are, if they fucking post on the internet, like they can, the enemy can geolocate them and drop fucking bombs on them. So don't bring your personal electronics out. I do know some guys that will bring like, just like a strict, strictly just music iPod. Um, if it's like a long, long flight in, um, stuff like that, but you don't want to bring any kind of phone or any kind of, any object that's going to outside of like your, your ID card and shit, that's going to be able to personally identify you. All right. This is going long. We're talking on target now. So on the approach, you need to know what your team leader uh, and your team look like in the dark. You need to learn how they walk. And this is stuff that you pick up over time and over spending, you know, X many hours out in the woods walking around in the dark. You will be able to tell who someone is by how they walk, even if you can't see their call sign or their face or they're, you know, if you're not close enough to see their kit, you will be able to pick up who someone is by based on how they walk. It's the fucking craziest shit. And it's the coolest shit. Um, but you need to like memorize, especially what your team leader looks like, what your squad leader looks like, and what your team at minimum looks like in the fucking dark. You need to have good noise and light discipline, meaning your fucking white light on your weapon is off and not able to be activated by accident. Uh, you need to not be using your laser a whole lot because the enemy's got fucking nods too. Um, and you need to, you know, not be talking fucking crazy loud. So this is something that's like ongoing. You don't want to, if you can move in the dark and stealth, like you want to be as quiet and as non visual 
as possible because a lot of the enemy doesn't have nods as well. So, and then the biggest, one of the biggest things when people talk about individual ranger discipline is maintaining correct spacing in the formation. So knowing exactly how far away from your team leader you need to be and being able to move and get closer or further away based on the changes in terrain and kind of the situation. So if you're walking across a big open field, your team leader will probably give you some kind of hand and arm signal for you to, sp to spread it out. And then as you get closer and maybe go back into a wood line, you're going to bring that wedge a lot tighter or you're going to go into a staggered file or a file. On the approach as well, you're going to make sure you pass any and all hand and arm signals you get. Um, and you're going to pass them uh, at least like the, we're going to do a whole video on hand and arm signals, but you're going to pass it at the spot that you get it. Um, and that'll make more sense in the next video, except for if it's a halt or a freeze uh, hand and arm signal, in which case you're going to do it and pass it back immediately and everyone's going to stop and freeze where they are. But I digress. This is an important part of individual ranger discipline is regardless if you think that everyone saw it, you're still going to do it. If you are taking a short halt, you're going to take a knee and seek cover immediately during short halts and you're going to maintain a firing hand on your weapon at all times. And this goes for every part of the operation. As soon as you step off that bird, that firing hand does not leave that weapon unless you're doing something that requires both of your fucking hands. Right. All right. And then you're going to maintain security at all times and you're going to scan your sector and you're going to need to know based on where you are in the formation, what area of responsibility or what sector you're responsible for providing security for. And that's going to change, you know, based on your, based on your position and your role in the squad. All right. So on target, you're obviously going to assign, execute your assigned role to perfection uh, to the utmost of your abilities. And then some, you're going to maintain accountability of your personal sensitive items, as well as your special equipment. So your nods, your freaking gun, your secondary your fucking laser your optic your light the gun itself and then if you've got like a camera a radio freaking litter hooligan tool anything that came with you you're responsible for and you need to maintain accountability of it it's your team leader's role as well to make sure that you got your shit but it's your role first and you you will be the one to get in trouble if you fucking lose something you're going to obey orders immediately and without hesitation if your team leader fucking tells you to do something, especially if it's in the middle of a fucking firefight, you need to pony up and listen to him and just say, Roger, moving. You don't fucking question shit out there. If you are in a firefight and you are getting shot at, you need to maintain ammo account of your ammo expenditure. And because this is important for your team leader to know, for lace reports, etc. And... This kind of goes for the whole assault force. It's not really necessarily pertaining to the individual, but everyone needs to maintain at least a single magazine or a hundred round belt if they're a saw gunner um, for exfil. Like you can't completely shoot, go black on ammo. Um, you need to be able to effectively engage and not just fucking mag dump because you do need to maintain shit for the exfil. Then you need to pass lace reports to the next level when asked in a prompt fashion. And now we're going to talk on Xville. So Xville, just because the mission's over, you fucking grab the dude you got to grab. You killed the dude you got to kill. And everything seems to be going handy dandy. You're fucking thinking about the, the damn food, the fucking breakfast you're going to eat on the way back, at the fucking chow hall. And then you guys get hit with a fucking ambush or some shit. So on Xville, you can't get complacent. Like you have to still do every single thing that we talked about earlier on the infill, maintaining security, proper spacing, uh, noise and light discipline, all of that shit still applies. Um, the game's not over until you're literally wheels down at the fucking fob or the fucking air base. Um, if you are taking helicopters, you need to maintain a proper PZ posture or pickup zone posture. So let me go back. Um, what this means is that you're just basically at, you're in a line and you have the LZ and everyone is facing opposite directions. Every other guy is facing a different direction or facing the same direction rather um, to provide security at the, uh, at the pickup zone. 
and you need to stay on a knee. You're not standing up. You're on a fucking knee. You're not in the prone because you might have to fucking pick up and move or you're going to get on the aircraft quickly. That's really only applicable if you are getting into a fucking helicopter at the end of the mission. And then lastly, you're going to make sure that you didn't leave anything. Ideally, before you leave the actual village, the target area, the objective area, whatever, you're going to get an SI check there and then you're going to get an SI check leaving or right before you get on a bird or right before you get in a fucking truck to leave. And that's, you know, the team leader's responsibility and the squad leader's responsibility. All right. Now we'll talk lastly, rearm refit. This is going to be shorter. So once you get back to your patrol base or your fucking ORP or maybe not ORP, patrol base would be probably better once you get to the patrol base area and that, you know, more patrol base activities. So, but we'll say fob or fucking cop or whatever. Um, this is in no particular order either. Um, but all of your electronics need to go off. So your fucking laser, your lights, your fucking optics, your cameras, your phones, your radios, all of them need to be turned off and then radios to the charging stand. You need to top off any and all magazines or drums of ammunition. You need to rehab your kit. So anything that fucking, you know, broke on it or whatever needs to get remedied then at this point. You're going to replace IR chems on your special equipment, and then you're going to pass any kind of docx or information that you got assigned to carry back. It's called sensitive site exploitation material, SSC material, to the proper channels and or through the proper channels and to the proper authorities and individuals. If you got fucking, if you twisted your ankle or whatever the fuck, and you know you got some kind of injury that didn't require any kind of medical attention during the operation. Uh, you're going to want to probably tell Doc about that, tell your team leader about it, just so that they can fucking get ahead of it and make sure that that shit gets treated so that you are combat ready. You're going to participate in the after action review, if applicable. Not necessarily everyone goes to these. Um, a minimum is going to be team leader and up, but sometimes, you know, your platoon sergeant wants the whole damn, all the homies in, and uh, you're going to go over the mission, what went well, what went wrong what they're going to change, what what kind of shit you're going to do better next time, etc. And regardless of the after action review, you also need to have the discipline to analyze and self reflect on your performance, both the positives, what you did well, as well as the negatives, what you didn't do well, what you need to change for next time to be more lethal. And then lastly, you're going to go get some fucking chow, you're going to make sure you rehydrate, and then you're going to catch some fucking disease probably and make sure you're well rested for the next mission. But that concludes our video here. This kind of went a lot longer than I thought. Um, but like I said, this is this shit is like super important. And it's the intangibles that you don't really hear about and you don't really get practice on unless you hear it from someone or unless you are, you know, in the army yourself. This is stuff that you pick up. But for your average dude out here that is trying to level up and become more tactically proficient, this is going to be a lot of good information for you. Take it to heart. Make sure your buddies know it. This shit is what makes you a fucking lethal killing machine out there. Um, obviously, there's a lot of stuff here that it, that's becoming maybe a little dated with the advent of fucking drones, the proliferation of night vision technology, and, and you know shit that we're seeing kind of going on in Ukraine right now. But this is still, I feel like the base, the the very very base level of of individual you know, soldiering, individual rangering discipline here. Um, and this stuff needs to become like second nature to you. So that's it. Tonight, we're going to be going live with Joe and potentially Shoemate again. Um, and if you're watching this past Friday, the 7th of April, 2023, go check it out. Go check out the podcast. But anyways, I'll talk to you all later, potentially tonight, if you come back for that. And uh, yeah, we'll have a good time. Take care.